WULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. You are listening to One Human Nation with your host, Sandy Batiste. This program will be talking about race and race relations in your community and nationally. Our goal is to be open, honest, and productive. This is WRU with your host, Sandy Batiste. Sorry about that, guys. I'm Sandy Batiste with the One Human Nation show, so just trying to stop one of these tracks from playing here. And we're we're good to go. So welcome to the One Human Nation show. Remember, the viewpoints expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of WRUU, its license holder, or its staff. Um, And remember that the following program uh, may contain subject matter and realistic language that some listeners may find objectionable. Listener discretion is advised. Um, it's been an interesting week <laughs> between uh, midterm elections here in Georgia and other places around the country. Um, and so this is kind of a continuation of the show that I did last week um, with one of the clips we weren't able to get to. And it's talking, um, addressing this issue of my continuing concern of, of why are we so divided um, in this country. And so one of the um, clips, a couple of the clips we listened to last week, and I encourage you to go to my podcast or to my Facebook page, and you can listen to that recording. And if you subscribe to the podcast, and I'll give you more instructions about that later in the show, you can get automatic updates, because I know for some of you, um, you know, it's it's getting to your next destination, getting your kids taken care of. So you may not be listening um, to the live show from five to six, but I do encourage you to tune in, uh, subscribe so you can get the podcast because I, I believe it's, it's absolutely critical for <laughs> just the most recent events that we've seen in the past couple of weeks. Um, it's critical for us to continue this journey of learning more and being in a place where we can have an open, safe, honest, uh, and productive conversation, which it seems to get harder and harder to find. <laughs> um, and so, um, so we're going to, we're going to get into that and I'm, I'm going to, um, start with, um, this clip that talks about, the um, divided states of America. And this particular clip, um, let me just make sure I've got the right one open here. Um, It's from um, Amy Chow um, or Chua, or I think it's Chow is how she pronounced it. Um, I found this really cool clip from her about political tribes and how group instinct and the fate of the nation. And so that's where we're going to start. And let me just make sure um, I've got the right clip up for that, because I might not have pulled, you know, it's always that little transition part that we go through here. And um, I want to make sure I've got the right one for her pulled up. So uh, as we get ready for this, I hope everyone has had a, a safe week, you know, that has not been the case um, for some of the people that, um, you know, were victims of another mass shooting in our country in the state of California. And so that's an ongoing thing. And that's kind of the second half of the show. We're going to talk about the the impact that it's having on this country because we're not dealing with the mental health issues. So the first part, we're going to talk about this division. And I sincerely hope, guys, this is the right clip. So let's take a listen um, to, you know, um, I'm hoping this is from Amy Chu and uh, or Chow. And it's, she has a book out, and I'm just going to give you the title. It's the Political Tribes, Group instinct and the fate of the nation. So let's see if this is the right clip here. One of Amy Chua's previous prominent books was the best-selling Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. Her new book might be thought of as a battle cry against divisive politics and for what it means to be an American. It's called Political Tribes, 
Group Instinct, and the Fate of Nations. Amy Chua is a lawyer and the John M. Duff Jr. Professor at the Yale Law School, and she joins us now for more. So nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having well, me. We've talked about your books on this program before, but we've never had you in that chair. So it's great to be here. Good, good to have you. Tribe is a very power-packed word these days. So let's get your definition of what you mean when you say it. Okay, so there are um, many different usages. You could be talking about an actual tribe, like the Pashtun tribes of Afghanistan. People often use it to refer to an ethnic affiliation. Um, I'm using it much more generally to refer to a particularly intense form of group identification. So here's the thing. Human beings are tribal animals. We need to belong. Um, studies show that we just absolutely crave membership. And once we connect to a group, we tend to want to cling to it and defend it no matter what and see it as always being right. And that's actually not always bad. You know, um, I'm a very tribal person. Family is a kind of tribalism, sports tribalism. The problem is when tribalism takes over the political system. Well, as it appears to have done so in your country right now. It really has. And what that the problem with that is that you start to see everything through the lens of your tribe. And it's almost like any news item will happen. Gun control, North Korea, really anything. And instead of having a conversation and thinking, what should I think? You kind of figure out what your leaders are saying. You, you take your, you hunker down into your positions and then you start blasting the other side. And it doesn't even matter if three years ago you're saying the opposite thing. So it's really prevented, um, people from having a conversation. And it's almost like we are in a situation, you know, studies show that one actually takes pleasure from um, uh, seeing the other side lose or suffer. So in some sense, we're not really having a substantive political dialogue now, um, but just rather two sides trying to demonize and um, take down the other side. At what point did you notice that starting to happen? That namely, it doesn't even matter if I win. It's not enough for me to win the argument. You have to lose the argument, and I don't have to listen to anything you say anymore. Well... This stuff is documentable. It's not just a feeling. You know, if you can look at Pew Foundation studies and surveys, you can see, just take something like immigration. Even just 20 years ago, the Democrats and the Republicans, there was much more overlap. You know, it's a very complicated issue. Some people favored it, some people were against, and people changed their minds. If you look at the polls right now, the Republicans are way more extreme in their views. You know, they want to cut down even on legal immigration. And the Repu sorry, the Democrats are similarly way more extreme. Um, you know, you can't use the word illegal. We're only talking about undocumented. And there's much less convergence in the middle. And that's true of all the hot button issues. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been a gradual process, but part of this really is a dem because of a demographic change that we've had. Uh, talk to me about that change. The demographic change that that America has experienced in the last, what period of time do you think is responsible for this? Well, it started in the 1960s when um, we had massive changes in our immigration laws that allowed people like my own parents to come over. Um, and so most of the United States history, um, most of our immigrants came from Europe. Mm -hmm. They were white. Um, and so for most of America's 200 year history, this was a country that was dominated economically, politically, and culturally by a white majority. Now, obviously, it's complicated who counted as white. It changed a little bit over time. But that was the basic dynamic. In the last 30 years, we've had a massive demographic change, partly just in terms of sheer numbers, you know, going from something like 600,000 a year to 7 million. Secondly, mm -hmm. at the source of the immigration. It used to be most of our immigrants came from Europe, now, the vast majority come from Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Caribbean. So the result is that we are seeing what people call the browning of America. And that is that for the first time in U.S. history, America's whites are on the verge of losing their status as a majority. And going to your question, when you say, when did you start to notice? That's partly what's happened. It used to be that it was the minorities who were threatened in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, for obvious reasons. Now, it's not just African Americans and Asian Americans who feel threatened or discriminated against. Whites feel threatened. A recent study showed that 67% of America's white working class feel that they are more discriminated against than minorities. And, you know, not just Muslims and Jews feel threatened. 
Christians now feel threatened. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of our political rhetoric. Men and women, straights and gays, everyone feels threatened. And when groups feel threatened, that's when they retreat into tribalism. They get more insular. Okay, but here's the thing. This may be a silly comparison to make, but let's make it anyway. Your country looks like it's on the verge of exploding because of all the tribalism that's happening right now. The browning that you've just described has happened in Canada as well. The city that you are in right now, the majority of the people in the capital city of Ontario were born outside this country, the majority. So it's happened here, but I don't get the sense that Canada's about to explode in the way that I do when I visit the States. Well, you know, it's interesting. You're listening to the One Human Nation show. We're going to take a pause right here just so I can, um, you know, give you time to digest, number one, because it's a lot of information to digest. The other is I want to give you this quote and see if you can um, determine who made this quote. And, and I'll give you some information about that in the context. And here's the quote. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, extinction, or it advocates will push it forward till it should become lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. So, you know, a little brain teaser to think about um, who said that. And if you haven't figured it out yet, it was Abraham Lincoln in his speech, The House Divided, that he made as president on June 16th, 1858. (laughs) And so here we are, 2018, still dealing with the divide. And it's gotten even more complicated. This is another quote that I like from MLK Jr. And he basically said in one of his quotes, I look forward confidently to the day when all who work for a living will be one with no thought of their separateness as Negroes, Jews, Italians, or any other distinctions. And so my thoughts on this, as I've mentioned before on the show, until we deal with the truth of our history, and de- until we can look at the truth and uh, being a, in a non-judgment mode, which requires having civil discourse, um, we won't get to the point of reconciliation and we won't get to the point of healing. It, it doesn't matter whether the topic is on gun control. It doesn't matter whether the topic is on um, how we deal with our prison systems or health systems. We have to deal with the core issue of what happened, the truth of what happened, and start the healing process. And to me, in many ways, that's an individual journey. And so that's why the One Human Nation show focus on, yes, we have guests on, and I'll give you um, how to access that if you want to be a guest on the show and share your story of your journey through race and racism in this country. Um, But that's what this is. This is a learning show. This is an opportunity for you to hopefully gather some information that will be beneficial for you as you continue on your race reconciliation journey. And I, I say that because we're coming up to the time of the year. Number one, I think everybody's just kind of fatigued. <laughs> you know, we're all kind of worn out of everything that's happened in um, 2000. Uh, 18. And so as we enter into the holiday season, that's supposed to be happy. That's where a lot of the turmoil still continues because we're dealing with family that many of us don't agree with their point of view. Um, And then, you know, so we're around Thanksgiving dinner and Thanksgiving table. And you might have not seen Uncle Joe in a year since the last, you know, Thanksgiving dinner. Um, And there may be some comments made that now to you are just things you just don't want to tolerate anymore, that you don't want to be exposed to, you don't want your family exposed to, you don't want to have to make excuses for Uncle Joe or Aunt Betty or whatever the situation 
religion is. And then we go from that to um, the Christmas season. So there's there's what I'm getting to is there's this time that we have this family time. And, you know, we have members in our family that, you know, some of them, we just don't agree with their point of view. And how do you have a civil discourse about that? Or do you have a civil court discourse about that? So as as you digest on that, we're going to pick up the conversation um, from Amy Chua uh, is the correct pronunciation of her name, just listening to the, the clip um, as she continues to talk about. Uh, political tribes and group instinct and the fate of the nations and kind of how we got to where we are um, and how we continue forward. It's interesting. Um, I think a lot of people in the United States did not think ever that Donald Trump would be elected. As you know, almost nobody predicted that. No, but has he um, precipitated it or reflected it? He's both. Uh, it's both. Yeah, it's okay. both. Um, and so I would say, because this book is really comparative and looks at a lot of different places, both Europe and even developing countries, I honestly don't think anyone is immune to these uh, demographic changes. And it does sometimes take a very inflammatory leader, a demagogic person, uh, to come in. But there could be differences. Um, you know, this is something I talk about. Uh, I actually think Canada has a nice formula. Um, you allow a lot of individual subgroup identities to flourish. Um, one thing that we're seeing in the United States, though, you know, is we have always had a much more um, kind of blatant form of patriotism. Uh, you know, rah, rah, USA, number one. So for all the parallels, the two countries are a little bit different. And that's part of what's going on in, in, in the United States right now. There's almost a battle for who can define the nation's identity. Hmm. And there are two different visions. One that is very, um, it's kind of looking back to tradition, the Mad Men days, you know, a mostly white country, patriotic, U USA, um, and one that ref when you mention cities, that is much more multicultural, much more cosmopolitan, um, you could say uh, uh, much more questioning of our founding story, mm -hmm. pointing out all the times that, you know, these great founders you talk about, they had slaves. Indeed. And that's a that's a really a, a point of um, intense disagreement right now. No, and I don't want to come off like we're somehow immune to this. We're clearly not. In fact, some people think we experienced it before you did in as much as Rob Ford was the mayor of Toronto. Uh, well before Donald Trump was president of the United yes. States. But listen, as long as we're going to go back, let, let us, in fact, take a look back through history, because your book starts in Vietnam. Yes. And, and I guess as we're looking through a tribal lens at things with the benefit of hindsight, what was it that, in your view, the United States didn't understand about tribalism 40 and 50 years ago as they got mired in the Vietnam quagmire? So the United States is so fascinatingly different from the way that the uh, that Great Britain was when it was in its imperial heyday. The British were so attuned to group differences when they were colonizing, and they used it to divide and conquer for, you know, very destructive purposes, but it also gave them a lot of control. The United States tends to view its foreign policy through these grand ideological um, lenses. We're always, they think, you know, it's capitalism versus communism. That's what we're doing. And then it moved to democracy versus authoritarianism. And most recently, terrorism versus, you know, freedom. Mm -hmm. And so when we go into countries, whether it's Vietnam or Iraq, we tend to see things in terms of these great ideological battles, and we tend to think that democracy will solve everything. So it's amazing. In Vietnam, we just thought we were in there saving the country. We were going to put in capitalism. And there were two things that we didn't notice. First, we really underestimated how much of the struggle for the Vietnamese people was for their sovereignty, for independence. It wasn't for some Marxist ideology. They, no, it you know, was most nationalism. Of the, it was nationalism. But here's something that most people probably still don't know. There was also an internal ethnic dimension, and that is that Vietnam had what I call a market-dominant minority. Most of its capitalists actually were not part of the Vietnamese people. They belonged to this Chinese, a tiny ethnic Chinese outsider minority. And a lot of Westerners will say, oh, Vietnamese, Chinese, same thing. No. Not according uh, to the Vietnamese. Not at all. Um, so we made this mistake because we were the champions of capitalism, and we actually didn't even notice that most of the capitalists in Vietnam belonged to this hated ethnic group. And we basically shot ourselves in the foot. We kept promoting capitalism and wondering why nobody wanted to, to come along with us and kept going to the other side. 
And you could probably tell the same story in Afghanistan, too, couldn't you? In Afghanistan, we saw everything. This was after 9-11. Suddenly, we changed our lens. It wasn't about communism anymore. It was about the war on terror, the axis of evil. So we saw the Taliban as a bunch of cave-dwelling fundamentalists. Um, now, they are, you know, Islamic fundamentalists, but we miss something else. The Taliban is also an ethnic movement. And it's amazing. We just ignored this. So mm -hmm. Afghanistan is a country that has um, at least 14 ethnic groups, and the Pashtuns are the largest. And the Taliban uh, is really a Pashtun nationalist movement, in a sense, in, addi mm -hmm. in addition to being a, a fundamentalist group. And what we missed when we went in there is we kind of didn't realize that the Pashtuns at that time, this is a group that had founded Afghanistan, controlled it, ruled it for hundreds of years. And right around that time, they were starting to lose their dominance to these rival ethnic groups, the Uzbeks and the Tajiks. What does the U.S. do? We are totally blind to these dynamics. Once again, we think we're going to take out all we can think of are Islamic terrorists. And we miss the fact that we aligned ourselves when we came in militarily with the Uzbeks and the Tajiks, mm -hmm. basically the main rivals of the Pashtuns. So we immediately, right off the bat, alienated, you know, the very people that we were trying to win over. And that's why, even though we thought we saw a massive military victory, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, our leader said, it's over, we won. Well, look, fast forward, 16 years later, um, they're still there. The Taliban is back. And now you can see there are books and books that say the Pashtun problem, the Pashtun dilemma. But my point is we're always coming back from behind. We're always too late. After we discover this, it's like now we've got to deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. But when we went in there at the beginning, we totally ignored these really important group identities that mattered most to the people on the ground. And, and if you add Iraq or Libya, I mean, there are many others that you talk about in the book to the equation. This is a problem that the American foreign policy establishment seems to make over and over and over and over. Why does it not learn? Well, first of all, yes. I mean, that's the thesis of the, uh, of the book, that we, um, for the last at least 50 years, have been just spectacularly blind to the group identities that matter most to the people on the ground in the countries that we're supposedly trying to help or liberate. And to answer your question why, I think it's something very distinctive about America's history. First, we have had an extraordinarily successful um, history of assimilation in our own country. So the, the thought is always, look, if Italians and Germans and Hungarians could all become Americans within a generation, hey, you know, the Sunnis and the Shias and the Kurds, they can become Iraqis. Let's just put in some elections. Well, except it didn't happen. It <laughs> And so this is something that I've been arguing for about 20 years, which is if you look at developing countries, we, America always thinks that democracy is going to be the panacea for group conflict. Mm -hmm. But under certain conditions, democracy can actually catalyze group conflict. But there was, at least I thought there was a better understanding when it came to Iraq, that it, there was a Sunni, Shia, and yes, Kurds in the North split in Iraq. But America seemed to understand that. And at, at least I remember at the beginning of the, of the war, there was a sense that that there is an Iraqi identity that is separate from Sunni and Shia, and therefore this should work. And here we are all these years well, later, and it still doesn't work. Yeah, I have a different take on it. Okay, um, go ahead. I, I think that we were colossally blind, and we're just, we couldn't have done it worse. Um, the, um, again, Iraq has what I call a market-dominant minority. That is, they had a 15% Sunni minority that had controlled that country for centuries, first under the Ottomans, which were a Sunni power, then under the British that favored that minority, and then under Saddam Hussein, who was a Sunni and who favored, not only did he favor the Sunnis, he persecuted the Shia majority mm -hmm. and the Kurds. So what I actually wrote in the afterword to my 2003 book, World on Fire, I predicted it. I said, what do you think is going to happen if you have a tiny, resented minority, 15%, that has ruled this country cruelly for centuries, and now you're going to empower the resentful majority? What I said is you are going to get 
payback time. And that's exactly what happened. The Shia used their newly found electoral majority power to um, retaliate against the Sunnis. And then the Sunnis seeing, oh my gosh, we're a minority, they joined the insurgency and they joined Al Qaeda and ISIS. So, so I think that we actually got it completely wrong. Um, we didn't work on how to build that unifying Iraqi uh, identity. In fact, we just, um, uh, we, we misunderstood that majority rule doesn't always um, work out for to, you know, freedom and prosperity. Well, you also tell us in the book that it's not limited to halfway around the world. Venezuela, in our own hemisphere, there still seems to have been an issue about Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and whether he was, you know, the, the next clarion call for communism and trying to nationalize everything and ruin America's plans there, or what? What did you conclude? So, again, this is a very powerful concept. If you, if you start to look... You just tuned in. You're listening to The One Human Nation Show. I'm your host, Sandy Batiste. So we're kind of getting some background information um, not only about the United States, but countries that the United States went into with what I consider to be a very ethnocentric um, attitude. And that is our way of doing things, having democracy in place is the right way to do it. And um, you're listening to Amy Chua talk about this. And we're going to get back to this after we make some announcements. So let's make some quick uh, public service announcements and you'll be tuned back into the One Human Nation show. I'm your host, Sandy Batiste. This is WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings. Community Radio with Global Soul. WRUU listeners like you crave exploration and discovery. That's how we can offer your business or organization a unique way to separate your name from the clutter inherent in commercial radio advertising. Underwriting on non-commercial WRUU will make your name stand out because we allow only a limited number of sponsorships per hour. And your message will be reaching listeners who are actively engaged in programs that demand their attention. Let our team build a customized plan to meet your marketing goals by linking your name to our unique music and talk programs. For more information, email underwriting at org. And if you just tuned in, you're listening to the One Human Nation show. And so we're going to continue and pick up where Amy Chu has given her opinion on what has happened historically, especially with the United States going into um, other countries with a very one-sided attitude that um, is you know, probably one of the reasons we're still engaged in a war in Afghanistan. Um, and so to, to me, it's more than just which political party in the United States is in, in office, because all of the political parties have missed the boat on this, I think, and what she's talking about. And it addresses why we're still divided as a country and how this has escalated over the years. And so let's continue to listen to Amy Chua. Um, her book that she has is called Political Tribes, Group Author, um, uh, I'm sorry, Political Tribes, Group Instinct, and the Fate of Nations. So let's continue listening to Amy Chua. to look at things. It's so confusing to look at the world. But if you think of unifying principles, again, I describe this concept of a market dominant minority. And in Venezuela, they had a very small, lighter skinned sort of European heritage um, minority that largely controlled the media and the oil. So in 1998, this guy that seems crazy, Hugo Chavez, he's an ex-con, former paratrooper, not so educated, horrified the elites. He begins to campaign and he, he's, from the point of view of the elite, he's talking nonsense. You know, he says things like um, he thought maybe capitalism had killed life on Mars. But he plays the race card. He says, look at me. He called himself the Indian from Barinas. He actually said, I have African features. And here's the thing. The country had never really talked about these racial tensions before. But it is, in fact, the case that despite the economy and most of the power being 
in the hands of lighter-skinned elite. The majority of the country was indigenous-blooded, had African heritage because there was a long legacy of slavery. And suddenly, all these people play, they buy into his populist appeal. Um, you know, he says, vote for me, I look like you, and they do. Donald Trump, that was the first tweeter-in-chief. <laughs> Hugo Chavez was. He was the first leader to kind of see the power of talking straight to the people. He had a reality TV show that he conducted while he was president. Hmm. He would go to a building and say, I mean, he would have millions of viewers, and he'd say, expropriate it, and people would love it. It was, it was actually very parallel. Hmm. Let's go back to America and talk about ethnic tension. Let's just read this excerpt from the book here. Divided. Indeed, there is now so little interaction, commonality, and intermarriage between rural, heartland, working-class whites and urban, coastal whites that the difference between them is practically what social scientists would consider an ethnic difference. They think of themselves as belonging to distinct and opposing political tribes. Now, this is really quite fascinating because no one thinks of, I shouldn't say no one, few people think of whites as being somehow distinctive or in different tribes, but they sure are. They, they really are. And in fact, you can see, I think this is one of the main features that explains the election of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I've been studying what it means to be an ethnic group for 20 years, and intermarriage and commonality and interaction is a lot of it. So on the coasts where I'm from, uh, Yale University, New York, San Francisco, the whites there tend to be very multicultural. They're probably like what you would expect in Toronto mm -hmm. uh, or Vancouver. Um, cosmopolitan tend to be liberal and very politically correct. That is, we, ever, we, we know how to speak in a way that doesn't offend a lot of people. Um, also, surprisingly, in, uh, insular. So mm -hmm. one thing I say is a lot of cosmopolitans think of themselves as the opposite of tribal. You know, we're global citizens. But in fact, it's a very snooty group very judgmental, um, and that group is so different from Donald Trump's base. Well, they may know Paris and Rome and London, but they may not know Montgomery, Alabama. And they often have never been there. And not mm. only that, there is tremendous mutual scorn and resentment. Mm. Um, and literally, people eat different foods. They, they dress differently. They speak differently. And obviously, if you look at the electoral map, they voted exactly differently. Mm -hmm. And part of the resentment, and it goes both ways, um, a lot of the Heartland uh, voters um, are much more suspicious of immigrants. They are much more negative about minorities, partly because they often have never really met one. Um, and what they do is they associate these coastal whites with, oh, you love minorities, you love immigrants. Why are you always trying to help the poor in Africa as opposed to real Americans? And that's what Donald Trump tapped into. If you look at Make America Great Again, that is a, um, a slogan that's kind of coded. And again, if you look comparatively at other countries, you see this a lot in countries where there is a resented tiny minority. And this I would describe as what we call coastal elites. It's a weird concept. They're not, the, they're not a tiny minority, though. In fact, they're you know, not a tiny minority. They may be the majority, considering they voted for Hillary. And she got more votes. That's exactly right. But from their kind of looking at people like who control Wall Street and Washington right. establishment and Silicon Valley. But you're right. It's They're lumping all these people together. And a lot of this is perception and then demagogues whipping it up. But the, the more important point is they're saying they're not real Americans. And... Donald Trump did very well by saying, let's take back our country. Mm -hmm. These people in charge of Washington, in charge of Wall Street, they don't care about you. They're selling the country to Canada, to Mexico, to China. Mm -hmm. Let's take back our country. And that rhetoric is something that you've seen in its own, you know, always with a different, uh, you know, language. Mm -hmm. In countries from Venezuela to the former Yugoslavia, you know, Serbia for Serbs, to Zimbabwe, you know, take back the country. Um, so once you look at it, things from a world lens, it makes a lot of sense, the dynamics. Okay, so there are these different dynamics and different splits within the white communities, if I can put it that way. Do you see similar things happening within the black communities or the Asian communities, that kind of thing? Uh, actually, there is a new development right now, which is um, in the 60s and 70s, the civil rights movement, 
uh, the left, the progressives, their watchword, I still remember this, you know, was really about inclusivity and equality. There was a sense of using these universalist terms. Um, people looked for a time when skin color wouldn't matter. Partly what happened was during the Reagan era, a lot of progressives correctly perceived that a lot of the universalist rhetoric, you know, oh, we're group neutral. Um, we're talking about inclusivity and equality was actually being used by conservatives to block affirmative action, to kind of um, not adopt policies that from the left's point of view was needed to correct deep racial inequities. So today, fast forward to uh, 2018, group blindness is the ultimate sin for the left. Um, you know, from Black Lives Matter to all of our Asian groups to it's really a sense of, look, um, we when you talk in terms of generalities or just equality, you are ignoring the very specific experiences of group oppression that different groups have had. Um, and that's really the talk on campuses. And I understand it. You know, I, I hate the way people try to go black or white. You know, we hate identity politics or we love identity politics. I think it's understandable. These are a lot of groups that have not been able to speak for a long time, and they're finally, you know, finding their identity. What I lament and criticize is that you can't only be these separate tribes. And that's what I uh, am arguing against. You can still feel a very strong sense of, you know, I'm Chinese-American, I'm Libyan-American, but we can't lose that connective tissue. We also need to work on ways that we can still feel that we're all Americans. Otherwise, we're going to go the way of a country like Libya, which is also a multi-ethnic mm -hmm. country, uh, but it's now a failed state because that Libyan overarching identity was not enough to, to bind that country together because it was really a colonial construct. Mm. Uh, to, uh, admittedly off the beaten path a little bit here, but wh which do you feel more connected to, your adjective or your noun? My adjective, or you mean the, the Chinese Japanese or the part? American? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, here's the thing. I do not, I think it's a false choice. And I think that's the danger. People say, which are you first? I not think, first. Or, it... well, salient, which do you feel more? Uh, here's the beauty of America. And by the way, I would throw Canada into this. Mm -hmm. It's very rare. I call America a super group, which is a country where you simultaneously have a very strong overarching identity. You know, I'm an American. And that's the first requirement. The second requirement is that it's a country where individual subgroup identities are allowed to flourish. You know, I'm Italian-American, I'm Irish-American, I'm Croatian-American, and you could still be very patriotic at the same time. And a country like France doesn't have that. You see, a France, they have a very strong overarching identity, the mm -hmm. French identity, but they do not allow individual subgroup identities. They're not identities. into adjectives there. It's interesting you put it, but because of Lacey Tay, they can't wear the, the headscarf, the burkini band. And a lot of people think that that's why they have so much radicalization, that there's a lot of unhappiness. So that's why I, I resist the premise. Um, I, I think that in countries that are very healthy, you can have both a very strong sense of overarching national identity. I think people can be very proud of being Canadian. Um, and yet you have these sub tribal, subgroups, subregional identities that should be able to coexist if you get it right. Uh, absolutely right. I mean, uh, quite agree. Having said that, there are some groups for whom the adjective becomes problematic in the eyes of some of the majority. Is that problematic in terms of tribalism in America today? Well, it would be. I mean, I think I, I do think it would be very problematic for somebody who, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of old fashioned that way. I think that uh, it would be terrible. It would not be good. Uh, now, we have free speech. And the way to do this, I think, is through persuasion, right? I mean, you can't control what every last person thinks. Um, so right now in the United States, you know, we have groups who say, look, this was a country that oppressed our ancestors. So we are struggling. And what I say is that we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We do need to correct our history books. We can't whitewash it and say, oh, these perfect guys came over um, and they did these perfect things. But nor do I think should we go all the way to the extreme and say what I hear a lot of people on the left saying, which is America is a land of oppression. It's not a land of freedom. It's a land of, it's built on white supremacy. I disagree. I think we did have white supremacy and we're still very much, we still see traces of this, but it's a huge difference between saying that we are a country built on great principles, you know, equality, uh, tolerance, and we have shamefully failed to live up to them. 
and we must keep trying. There's a huge difference between saying that, that we are a country built on great principles, and saying that we're, that those principles are all lies. That, you know, they were never there to begin with. And so I'm sort of a romantic. I think that we need to correct the history, but we need to work on a way that formerly oppressed groups can really buy it, start to buy into the idea of America as a moral nation. And for people who feel like their groups are treated unfairly, you know, without the same respect, they get shot disproportionately, how can you expect them to think of America as a great nation? Mm -hmm. So for me, there's work to be done both on the right and the left. And that's the problem with tribalism. They're just talking past each other, attacking the other side, demonizing each other, you know, with, with no progress at all. Well, here's the question. David Frum was in that chair not too long ago, and one of the questions that he posed in his book that no one knows the answer to yet, of course, is, are we at the beginning of the end of this tribalism? And, you know, is there a possible way back? Or is this just really the beginning of the beginning? And your country is about to descend even further into chaos. You got a view on that? Yeah, David and I are opposites. I think it may have to do with me being an immigrant's daughter. Uh, I, we're, I love his thinking. I'm an optimist. Um, and uh, I think he's a little bit less so. Um, again, maybe it's personal. You know, I um, obviously am not white. Uh, my parents love the monuments. They love the founding myth. Uh, and they have experienced discrimination. So I don't think it has to be either or. And part of what I think is wrong with the dialogue in the United States is that people want to make everything either or. Um, so the studies that I most like in my book are the ones um, at the very end I collect. They're, they're so optimistic. They show that if you can pull people out of their tribal context and have them interact with each other as human beings. But I don't just mean exposure. Studies show that if you put diverse peoples together in the room and they don't really talk to each other, they can just hate each other even more. <laughs> but if you pull a Trump supporter and a Trump hater and say, don't talk about politics, talk about dogs or your sports commonality mm -hmm. or your children, what you want for your children or your Norms can change, and the studies are actually astonishing. You know, the integration of our military mm. in the 50s, no one thought this could work. But when people threw African-Americans, Mexican-Americans, Italian-Americans into the trenches, um, they quickly saw, you know, once you have to trust your life to somebody else, um, or your, you don't care what accent they have mm -hmm. or the color of their skin. Amy, I want to finish up on this because one of the tribes, it seems to me, in the course of American history that has been utterly uh, powerful and immune to any kind of facts uh, are gun owners. And it has felt like, admittedly north of the border, we're looking, we're looking from afar, it has felt like it didn't matter how much chaos or mayhem happened in your country, um, you know, gun ownership, damn it, was still going to be a Second Amendment right, and there were going to be no laws passed by Congress to abridge anything having to do with that. Until recently, the Florida school shooting, again, feels like, I don't yeah. know, but it feels like an inflection point in history. Do you think so? It could be, but here's what I'm worried about. Mm -hmm. um, right after the Parkland shooting, I actually wrote about this. I thought it could be um, a norm-changing moment, because those young high school kids suffered so much. And at the beginning, it was nonpartisan. In fact, I met some of them. Many of their parents actually owned guns, you know? And so it wasn't really political at the beginning. It was just grieving people speaking from the heart. And you saw the polls change. You saw American public um, opinion really change. It moved. Here's what I'm worried about. Immediately, uh, I mean, people had not even stopped mourning. You saw action on the left and the right, Trump immediately trying to seize it, which is, okay, this is all about against the NRA, or the right saying these are actors, these, 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 they're not even real activists, um, and turning it back into this partisan thing. What worries me is that I worry that we've actually lost ground in the last month. People are viewing these big marches, and maybe there's still hope, but I've seen that people have actually retreated more. And you see that politicians are trying to say, look, this is a Democrat versus Republican thing. And the studies show that once this becomes partisan, and you can see the rhetoric changing with both sides saying, oh, you know, those guys, they like seeing children die. And then the other side saying, oh, they're murderers. And as soon as you go into that dial 
kind of dialogue where you're attacking the other side in such harsh terms. These examples I give in my book is you don't get the progress. Hmm. So fingers crossed right now, you can see the dialogue shifting. One of the survivors tweeted out saying, talk to the other side. So you see hope like that. But again, but then you, know, you see Laura Ingram on the other side. You do, and you see cable news, and yeah. you see people get higher ratings if you if you demonize the other mm. side. And it, it really, it's it's it is an inflection point. And you know, I hope it goes the right way. Amen. Political tribes, group instinct, and the fate of nations. That's Amy Chua's latest contribution to our bookshelves. And we thank you very much for coming into TVO tonight. Thanks so much for having me. If you just tuned in, you're listening to the One Human Nation show, and I realize that there's a, a public service announcement that I need to play, so I'm going to play one of those right now. The, the open enrollment period under the Affordable Care Act will begin on November 1st and end on December 15th. If you need help enrolling, Insure Georgia is a nonprofit vendor and politically neutral assistance program with telephone, online, and in-person navigators available to help. Open enrollment events will be held in Chatham County. Telephone navigators are available at 1-866-988-8246. Online navigators and more information is available at insureGA.org. If you just tuned in, you're listening to the One Human Nation show, and I'm looking at our time, and there's one more clip that I wanted to get into, but I can tell you right now we're not going to be able to listen to the entire one, so we'll pick it up on the next week's show. But uh, in reference to what we just listened to from Amy Chua, um, you know, there's some things that have happened since then. You know, you had the Las Vegas shooting. Um, we had the shooting at the Jewish syn synagogue. We've had the, um, just recently, in the past 24 hours, um, the Thousand Oaks shooting in California. And that turned out to be a former Marine that was identified with PTSD. So the clip we're going to listen to just a little bit of talks about the mental health crisis in our country. And this was one that I um, located in talking to uh, or listening to different clips from um, TED Talks from Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. So let's listen as much as we can for the next couple of minutes um, as we get ready to turn over to Troy Stoner with Sound Limit. Um, so, you know, we'll listen to a little bit of this and then we'll get, um, we'll pick it up next week. So let's take a listen. The evidence about mental, the mental health crisis of adolescents. When Greg and I wrote the article, we were, you know, we saw lots of hints that depression and anxiety were going way up. Yeah. And we think that's related to the, the overprotection. Yeah, uh, let's, okay, so let, let's talk about that just for a second and then sure. go back to the book. So I've got a dem potential demographic explanation okay. for that in part. Well, and I don't know if you guys have looked into this or not. Well, there, there's, there's two things that I think might be contributing to it. One is... Two or three things. One is the average age at which children are, uh, the average age at which people have children has gone way up. That's true. Okay, so why does okay. that matter? Well, because I think people get more conservative and cautious as they get older. A little and, bit, but that, true, but it's a very small effect. Okay. And, and it's, wait a second. Okay. It's the having of the kids, which is what makes them more conservative. When you have kids, you are more threat sensitive, you're more likely to vote for the right wing party. So just delaying child. Child, uh, childbirth wouldn't. Okay. What about it. what about fewer siblings? That would yes, that's part of it, uh, and this is what we're seeing in Asia too. When you have a lot of kids, you're not quite as worried. You don't have all your eggs in one basket. Well, and you can't, and you can't be quite as worried. Yeah. And the siblings raise each other. That's right. Right, and then there's a lot of and dominance. They fight a lot more. Right. They, they play have a lot and more. fight. Exactly. It's the free play and the fighting, the working things out for themselves. Those are essential skills of adulthood. Okay, so could, so then, all right. So, yeah. we could so also smaller develop. family size is part of it, I right. do agree. Right, well, and then also what's happening increasingly in schools is that kids aren't allowed free play, and they're certainly exactly. not allowed rough and tumble free play. Exactly. Which, That's right. That's one of the biggest things of all. So the two, the, the, there are three giant, there, there are a lot of causes. It's, it's, I mean, this is such, actually, it's a really fun puzzle because it's like the biggest social science puzzle of our age. What is happening that's making so many of our systems go haywire and I'm focusing on the universities. 
the big three, I would say, are one is the loss of, of, free, of unsupervised free play. Yeah, um, okay. And Peter Gray has been brilliant on this. He's uh, at Boston College showing how even among young animals, they have to practice the skills for adulthood. Yeah. And getting in Pegs conflict... have shown that too. Exactly. So getting in conflicts and then dealing with it and sometimes losing and right. you come back. Having a game in which there's a problem, but you have to work it out or the game stops. That's what kids always did. Yeah. It's only recently, in the nine, beginning of the 90s, that they're always supervised. Because we're afraid if we take our eyes off them, they'll be kidnapped. And that was which never is, a risk. It was so, never a risk. You know, I've kind of wondered about this gender flexibility issue as a form of delayed fantasy play. Uh, I hate to cut you off right there, but it's time for us to do the what I call the transitions shuffle <laughs> so that Troy can get set up for sound limit. Uh, thanks for listening to the one human nation show. If you want to reach out to me, you can do that via email at my story at one human nation dot info. And again, sign up for the podcast. You can do so by going to WRUU.org. It's a little bit more steps to do it that way. Um, because you have to go to schedule an archive. I would I would hugely su- uh, suggest if you're on Facebook, um, connect with the Facebook page, One Human Nation. You can also connect on iTunes. If you look for One Human Nation, it'll come up and you can subscribe to the podcast there. Um, and also I have a YouTube channel. So there's several ways if you miss the show and you want to continue on your race reconciliation journey and what that's all about for you, because it's about the individual. It's about not having judgment. Um, you know, your opinion is your opinion. And, you know, part of your journey and being able to have civil conversations is you've got to feel comfortable in what you're talking about. You've got to do some research and you've got to do some soul searching, um, because, of, as I've said at the beginning of uh, starting this series or starting the show back in 2017, is that we all have our biases. We all have our prejudices and what be- creates the problem Number one is if we're in denial about it um, and we have this unconscious bias and we're in in positions and situations where we can influence a change if we were even aware of our individual biases. So continue on your journey until next week and um, listen a little bit more of the B minor groove that uh, was created for me by Joe Morales, a wonderful jazz musician out of Austin, Texas, as we get ready for Sound Limit with Troy Stoner. (laughs) 